so that they couldn't close down on your position. The Nash Horn was phased out with the introduction of the first really successful purpose-designed German tank hunter, the Jagdpanzer IV. Manufactured by Vomag, this sleek machine boasted low silhouette, a machine gun for close defense, and gave its crew the all-round protection of thick, well-sloped armor. The first really effective purpose-designed tank killer had arrived. But in 1944, it had arrived too late to tip the balance. It's the Jagdpanzer IV Long. Carries the L70 gun, the same as the Panther, 75 mm This is a early 44 model. It was abandoned late 44, captured by the Allies, brought back to this country for uh, test and evaluation. It's stayed here ever since. It had a five-man crew, very cramped, very noisy, very dirty. The Allied bombing campaigns now paralyzing Germany's industry limited the numbers produced to just under 1,800. By this stage of the war, there was never going to be enough to stem the tide of armor flooding in against Germany from every side. To complement the Panzer Jager IV in these last-ditch battles, the Czech manufacturers, Praga, finally managed to produce a first-class tank destroyer. This was the Hetzer. Much smaller than the Panzer Jager IV, it nonetheless packed a highly effective 76mm gun. Coupled with very good sloping armor, excellent mobility and a very low silhouette, this small vehicle, which resembled a miniature Panzer Jager, was deceptively powerful and was much loved by its crews. Fortunately for the hard-pressed Germans, the Czech tank works were reasonably efficient manufacturers and some 2,500 machines reached the hard-pressed front lines. This is the Herzer, and one of the things about it is it, it, it's a marked improvement over some of the earlier German anti-tank guns. Uh, a lot of the earlier German anti-tank guns were open, and as you can see, this vehicle is completely enclosed. It has a very high-velocity 75mm gun. It's made in Czechoslovakia, very good suspension system, a very good engine, and the crews liked it very, very, very much. These knocked-out Hetzers from the archives of the Tank Museum at Bovington show just how common they were in the Normandy battles. Supplied in even more limited numbers was the next machine to emerge from the German armament industry, the Jagdpanther. Based on the successful chassis tank design for the Panther tank, by following the principle of dispensing with the turret, the Jagdpanther could carry a high-velocity 88mm gun, as opposed to the 76mm gun of the ordinary Panther. Its superb sloped armor gave the Jagdpanther enormous defensive advantages, a relatively low silhouette, and a fearsome attacking power. However, production difficulties meant only 350 of this, the best tank destroyer of the war, ever reached the front. This rare footage shows a transporter train moving these precious machines to the hard-pressed Russian front. This is the uh, Yag Panther. It's been called the best tank destroyer of World War II, and that's probably the case. It has a very, very good gun. It's an 88 millimeter gun. The, uh, the Panther itself had a 75 millimeter gun, but by doing away with the turret, uh, you can lower the profile of the vehicle, you can armor up the front of this uh, very, very well, and um, it became a, a very, very effective anti-tank weapon. Uh, the crews liked it, uh, but uh, it does have some deficiencies, not the least of which is the running gear. Now, if you notice, the, the running gear here is shaped very oddly. You have a single wheel here, but two road wheels here, a single here, two here, and so on and so forth. Well. One of the things that happens with this vehicle is mud gets up in here and it would freeze. So you'd get up the next morning and you have a pillbox. 
That's one fault. The other problem, though, is notice that if this road wheel back in here, the one back in here, uh, fails and you need to replace it, you need to take off five road wheels. This one, that one, this one, this one, and this one to get to it. So there's a lot of maintenance involved in this vehicle. And two, back up here on the back deck, if you have to work on this thing, if it broke down, there are a lot of places where you have to work upside down and blind on it. And if you drop your tools, they're gone. In even shorter supply than the Jagd Panther was the cumbersome Jagd Tiger, a veritable fortress on tracks. In keeping with the German practice of mounting larger guns into turretless tanks, the Jagd Tiger mounted a massive high-velocity 128mm gun, which was so powerful it could destroy any Allied tank on the battlefield at almost any range. Fortunately for the Allies, only 48 were produced, and these so late in the war that even their massive firepower could not hope to thwart the inevitable tide of defeat. Most were destroyed by their own crews when they ran out of fuel, broke down, or had fired the last of their ammunition. This is the Yacht Tiger, and this is a really bad idea. It's the chassis of the Tiger II tank. It has a 128 millimeter gun in it. It's the largest anti-tank gun mounted on a chassis in World War II. Uh, but the vehicle is just huge. Uh, combat loaded weight of about 85 tons. So no bridge could support it in, in Europe. There's a major river, what, every 50 miles in Europe, so no bridge could take it. You had to, have to raft it across uh, uh, rivers. Uh, and two, it gets about eight gallons to the mile. This when uh, the German army had very little fuel. Uh, when you fill this thing up uh, with a fuel browser, you're looking around for another one right away. Uh, these are the fuel tracks. And um, when this thing moved by railroad track, you had to put on smaller tracks so the two trains could pass each other on parallel tracks. So the crews did not like this vehicle. It was sort of meat on the table for rocket firing Typhoon and T-51 aircraft. The stalemate of the trenches during the Great War had a lasting effect on all the participants in that appalling conflict. Germany had suffered more than any other nation from the grim years of the Great War. But it was the British who had found the potential means to unlock the stalemate. The introduction of the tank in 1916 could well have revolutionized the course of the Great War and broken the deadlock. But the potential of this new innovation was stifled by a lack of strategic vision in the British High Command, and the possibility of an early return to open warfare was thrown away by poor British tactics. By 1917, the first British tanks had fallen into German hands, and these captured British machines were soon copied and adapted to produce the first German machines. This is an A7V Sturmpanzerwagen, the first German tank to go into battle. It was knocked out by the British in 1918. These early tanks were produced too late to make an impact in the First World War, but the lessons were not forgotten by the German military men. In 1939, the scars which came from long years of attritional warfare during the Great War were still fresh for the defeated Wehrmacht. In consequence, Germany's new breed of commanders were determined not to repeat the mistakes of 1918. They saw the tank as a key element in that vision, and they embraced the new tactical doctrine of Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War. Blitzkrieg tactics relied upon the possibility of fast, mobile operations, spearheaded by large concentrations of fast, well-armoured battle tanks. Under Blitzkrieg tactics, all of the tanks of the army were concentrated into the fast-moving panzer divisions, which were thrust deep into the rear positions of an enemy force, spreading panic and confusion.